Hello and welcome to the Build a Soil YouTube channel. This is season three, episode three. Today we're gonna to be going over the grow environment in early stages while we're doing the seed germination. And we're gonna give you an update on the progress of the seeds as a few of them have just started poking through the surface. We're also gonna go over the grow room environment and what I did to adjust it as far as seed starting. And I'll show you the Niwa, which I have here. And that is the controller that we're using to run the grow room in here. You can use something like that or you can just follow the parameters that we're using manually. But we'll talk about those details as well, how you might accomplish that. So let's jump in, let's get started and talk about what I've done since the last time you guys talked to me. Let me grab the journal. This is something new that we're doing. If you've been following along, we've just kind of winged it. Now we've got a journal and we're gonna discuss the temperatures in here and the humidity today. We planted the seeds Friday around noon. So we've got that documented in here and it's a little bit past noon today on Monday. So it's been three days, right, since we, put the seeds in soil. And so to see some of them already germinating is really exciting. That's what you'd like to see. All right, and so besides turning the humidity on, we did also spread cover crop on the 30 gallons and on the three by three container. And I wanna show you the cover crop because it's actually coming through on day three. But I wanna take you back right now and show you what it looked like before. And we're gonna put that cover crop down. So I've got my 12 seed clover crop half pound bag. There's 12 varieties of seed in this mixture. And that is about the number in permaculture that you're looking for, for diversity. 12 different species starts to really up the ante and the diversity, making it so that your property has a lot of attractive features for beneficial insects and bees and feeds the soil, fixes nitrogen. So these cover crop accomplish all that. You can look up more information on cover crop. I've got the 30 gallon beds. The only thing I've done so far was put the Bavaria bassiana in there. And then I watered this in. I was just trying to bring the moisture back up in here because these have been already used before. The one on the left there says tested on it. And this is the one we sent to the lab for testing. And we're going to balance it according to the soil test to prove to you that you don't need a soil test and that they are both going to do really well. We're going to do this one according to the build a soil way, but I'd like to grow some cover crop first. And we're going to actually treat this as a cover crop, not as a living mulch. So this first round of seed that I'm gonna put in here, it's gonna be worked back into the soil as sort of a green manure. I'm gonna grow it right in the soil and I'm gonna break it down and smash it and put it along with the mulch to feed the soil. I'm gonna put whatever amendments that I want on top of the cover crop and mulch it all together as sort of a living food for my soil. The worms will come up and eat it and this is part of the build a soil way. If you already have cover crop going from the last round and you're just looking to transplant, that's great. You may not need to add new seed, if you'd like to add more seed because seed is a fertilizer and it is going to grow more, you can certainly do that too. A lot of times, if this is multiple rounds, your cover crop will be dropping its own seed. It'll be germinating kind of on its own, but we didn't keep this cycle going. We interrupted it for a couple of months. So now that we're ramping back up, I've got the cover, uh, cover crop seed. I only have a half pound. It's going to do more than this whole tent. So you don't need a lot. I'm going to go through these 30 gallons and this three by three bed because I just want something growing in them. I want them ramp back up to life. So if you look in here, see the different size seeds? I just wanna take a handful of that and get those evenly spread around here. And I normally grab about a quarter cup per container. So about that much. And I'm just gonna sprinkle it around. I try and hit all the way to the edges. And then I go back to the middle. There's nowhere where I'm not trying to get it. Some people will leave like a cup here, put cover crop everywhere. That way when they transplant, they don't disturb any. I could do a little more. You can go hard on it if you want, kind of overseed it, get some really fast growth out of it. So. That's what I'm gonna do. Now, I've got some more steps. I'm not done yet. I'm actually gonna work this in with my hands and cover it with mulch, but give me a minute. I'm gonna do this bed too. This is our blue oyster straw log. This is a mini one. They use everything down there. They, the last bag they made, they couldn't fill full and they ran mushrooms out of it and they just gave this to me. But we sell full size bags about twice this size at buildasoil.com. And the reason you use it is it's a mulch layer that's fully inoculated with blue oyster fungi from growing them for edible mushrooms, organic. There's still some cover crop in here from the last grow, but not much. So I'm just gonna go and throw the cover crop seed everywhere in here, just like the 30 gallons. You'll notice there's some stalks from the last go. I can try and take those out, but I'm just gonna leave them in here, let the cover crop grow, and I'll deal with that when I go to transplant. I don't need to plant right there. So I can just leave this stalk and plant next to it, and then I don't have to disturb the soil. If you have to, you can cut this out with like a gardening knife or just twist it when it's nice and wet, and it'll just pop right out really easily, especially if it's been sitting there a little while. That's it, you don't have to be perfect, just throw the seed like a kid. It's fun. Doesn't have to be perfect.
Okay, that's it. I threw the seed in there. Now here's the next step. I think it's important. You wanna get good soil contact with the seed so that it germinates. Just throwing it on the surface, it's not gonna do anything. Even if we spray it with water every day, it'd be hard to get it all to germinate that way. I wanna get good contact with the soil. That'll allow the seed to do its job to wick the moisture into itself properly instead of getting air dried. I'm just gonna grab my hand like this and I'm just, I'm not gonna like bury it, but I'm just gonna wiggle it in so it gets below whatever mulch is kind of already in here and actually makes contact with the soil. On acreage, this would be kind of like raking it in. You would just use a rake and you'd rake all the seed into contact with the soil so that it germinates properly. It's gonna go through, just getting it into contact with the soil, that's it. Just shake it through the little bit of mulch that's in here. That's it, same thing here. Leaves from last time, it's all feeding the soil, it's fine. There we go, good contact with the soil now. So I'm gonna make sure there's good moisture in here then put the mulch down, then spray it one last time to kind of glue the mulch to the seed. The only consideration with the mulch, I've only got a half bag, I'm gonna do a really light layer of mulch. I don't want it to be so thick the seed doesn't sprout through, but I do want to shade it so that it doesn't dry out in here and I don't have to tend to it. it makes it really easy for me. So I've got the chapin, I've got some root wise in here, I've got the microbe complete, and I've got the uh, enzymes as well as the Q Yaha, the Q. And you can tell the Q's in there because it gets all foamy and that's what holds the moisture in there. You don't have to cover crop to do this, but cover crop's a big part of building soil. So I think that's important. Now you don't have to have mulch. That's a big part of building soil and it's a big part of covering the soil and doing everything that we want to do to mimic nature. I'm gonna open up this fully and I'll just take some of it over to the other containers there. Look at all the mycelium in there, it's pretty crazy fully just myceliated out, nice and moist, so it doesn't make any dust. dust. One of the reasons why I like using these. And the other reason people like this is it's all organic straw. They grow organic mushrooms on it, and it's a waste, so it's kind of recycling once they've already grown the mushrooms. But they were sterilized before they were built, so it's not like you're getting any weird problems from the field where the hay came from or the straw came from. And although I've never really had problems with straw, I know some people are worried about it, so getting something that's sterilized first is really, really good. Plus it's protected by the fungi that's already on there, all the blue oyster. And blue oyster is good at remediating heavy metals, all sorts of things. So lots of reason to learn about fungi. I'm gonna spread this out. Now I'm gonna carry this before I get too spread out to my other one. I'll throw one there. That's enough for probably both of them. I don't want it too thick because I don't wanna cover the cover crop seed to the point where it won't germinate. I just wanna block the light and the air from drying out and actually drying the cover crop seed out. And then I'll get really good germination in here. It's kind of matted together. So I like to really just break it up so the seeds can come through and I don't have like a really thick matting of it where just nothing can grow through. See these chunks? I'm just gonna break those up. It's kind of flat. There we go, that looks really good. I'm gonna do the same thing to the other two and then I'm gonna hit it with a water can one more time. If you have these big thick pieces like that and it's laying flat, it's gonna be hard for the cover crop to go through. If you want to see where this product was made, you can check out our mushroom farm tour video on our YouTube channel. It's one of the most popular ones. And we just walk through this local organic mushroom farm. Great people, great facility. They got an aquaponics grow there here in Montrose, Colorado. And we love that we get to work together. And if you're curious about that stuff, you can see where this comes from. Part of being transparent where everything comes from for Build-A-Soil customers. Okay, there we go. That's good enough to get the cover crop going. It'll kind of just loosely cover those seed. Nothing too thick. Do the same thing here. And now the mulch is already moist because it comes that way out of the bag. I already sprayed the soil down. Last thing for me to do is I kind of want to glue this together so that it keeps the moisture in. And I'm gonna do one last spray. Same on all of them. I've got my journal outside. I'm gonna go right in here about how much water we put in. I'll put the approximate amount of cover crop seed that we put per container. And then when you're referencing those notes, if you ever want, you can jump back here and watch the video of me actually doing it. If you got any questions about this part in particular, just drop them in here and we'll be happy to answer them for you. And we'll jump back to where we're at currently so I can show you the seeds. So. Next step, I came in on Saturday, the day after we planted the seeds, and I misted the seeds with plain water because the tops were getting just a little bit dry since I don't have domes on there. And then the other thing that I did is I raised the humidity up. I had it turned on, but I didn't have it high enough, but I wanted it to stay moist so I could leave. Normally at home, you can go peek in there like before you go to bed, but when it's at the office, it's a little unnerving not to be able to give it that, that double check. And I didn't have domes that would fit these, so that's what I did. In here, it's been about 72 degrees. We put in another new timber that he sent us. We built that one and recorded it. Either way, the reason I did that is I don't have a heater to put in here. 
and I didn't want it to be like 60 degrees. I wanted it to be above 70 degrees, maybe closer to 80, 85 during the day. I also misted the 30s and the three by three just a little bit to make sure that the seed, the cover crop seed that I put in there stayed moist and on a good path towards germination. Then I came in again on Sunday at 11 a.m. I misted the tops of the soil and everything looked perfect. It wasn't as dry this time on Sunday because I cranked the humidity up, but I could tell that it was starting to dry out a little bit as there's fans on and even with high humidity, that light is right above it drying it out a bit. So I misted the top just barely. I don't really wanna soak it and they felt the right weight. So everything was good. The last thing that I did on Sunday was a preventative treatment. In the three by three in the 30s, there was a couple of fungus gnats flying around and they're pretty normal when you have compost, but I don't want ever there to be a proliferation. And when you're on no-till and you keep things moist, a little bit of dry down usually eliminates any sort of infestation. But right before we start to add top dressing and till cover crop in and make it a lot harder for us to treat, I wanted to give it a preventative. So I tried something I haven't done before and it was straight doctor's imes. And what I did is I took the hot water that we have here on our like drinking water. It's basically reverse osmosis, the big five gallon jugs. And I used the hot water portion and a little bit of the cold and I made one gallon of about 100 degree water. That's very, very clean water. And I took nine ounces of the Zymes and put it in there. And part of this was a test because I could always put more cover crop seed in, but I sprayed the bed and the 30s with nine ounces per gallon of the Dr. Zymes and the seeds are germinating beautifully. Seed germination is, is an enzyme driven process, so I didn't think it would cause a problem. I'm not really seeing any gnats, but it's too early to tell. I was using that to kill any potential larva that there might be. And we'll just address anything that goes on in, the, uh, in this grow tent uh, throughout the season as we go forward. That's the last of my notes. Let's put the journal down. I will take notes when I'm done today. I'll show you the Niwa, show you my recipe in here. So we are on 18 hours of light right now. For those of you that are wondering, this is what it looks like. It's a Niwa grow hub. Essentially it comes with an app and it comes with a sensor and it gives you humidity, temperature, and light levels. It does four devices at the same time, lamps, fans, watering pump, all that stuff, air conditioner, humidifier, dehumidifier. It can't handle that much amperage, but we're using it as a controller. So we actually plugged in a four light light box that is hardwired to the electrical and we ran the on off relay plug to this. So when my Niwa says lights on, all four lights come on immediately through that controller box and that properly handles the load. If you're curious about that, you can check more info on season two, where we cover the install of that actual box and discuss the, electronic, uh, the electrical component side of it. Basically, if you're about to plug a whole bunch of lights into those things, make sure you read the instructions. We've got people here that can help reach out to support at Build a Soil or you know, put a, a question here in the comments. Let me pull up the app because it's really cool. This is Grow Hub 2 and that's this tent. If I look at one day, you can see the lights were on this morning. Let me zoom out just a little bit. So there's where we're at on the one day it looks like. And there was like the last night where the lights were off. And then today is it ramped up. And then if you tap it, it shows you where you're currently at. But this is what the sensor looks like. I've got it in the center of the grow tent right now and it'll pick up the humidity and temperature. I've got the humidifier unplugged right now and this is running clean water. Very important. I put reverse osmosis water in here, zero parts per million. That way all the water that's generated because I'm running it extra high um, it's all clean. It's not going to put white film all over everything in here. Last season, we didn't do that. And I'll also let you know how that goes if I notice any film at all. I'm not expecting any, but we'll, give, we'll keep you updated on the differences. So that's what the graphs look like. You can go back a day, 12 hours, one week, and you can see every little bit. I'm going to go to the recipe. And here's all the different like recipes that I've generated. You can make a whole bunch. Here's 10 by 10 veg. So we go to the details and I can see it or I can actually edit it while it's running and it'll turn it on and off. Going to the details, here's the first setting, light. I have my lights on from 6 a.m. to midnight. My watering, I have no watering on because I'm not running a drip system. My climate, from 6 a.m. to midnight, I have it at 90 degrees. I have it at 85% humidity. Then what happens is that at night, so right after midnight, it, the lights go off. And for six hours, I set the target temp at 72 and the humidity at 43%. These lows, I'm not really paying attention to. The high temperature, I'm not really paying attention to. Right now, I'm not exhausting, I'm not doing anything. All I've really set is the humidity. You may have a, a different weakest link. Just focus on that. Um, as we go forward, I'm gonna put, put an air intake and turn that on constantly to bring fresh air in here all the time with fresh CO2, filtered clean air. I'm also gonna be exhausting the air based on two principles. One is either gonna be heat, the other one might be humidity. So depending on whether I'm trying to keep heat down, I would have my exhaust based on heat. 
The other one is if it's getting too humid because the plants are transpiring so quickly with these grow lights and so much soil in here and everything, then I would turn on my exhaust to operate based on humidity. It depends on what I really want to go after. Main thing is, is I'll always keep fresh airflow in here regardless. So we're bringing fresh CO2 in. The exhaust will be dependent on my environment and that's how I'm going to set it up. We'll show you as we go through that and why you might want to do it. We do it every season and I think it's an important learning process for new growers, especially indoors. It's a little bit different than outdoors. So let's look at the seeds. We should probably go over the genetics at some point, but Coot was really kind and sent me a really nice write-up from him and his buddy that made the seeds explaining the providence, the history of these genetics, and I'd like to share it with you. Um, but these are the ones right here. And I see two here that the seed is pushed through the top of the soil, very hard to see, right underneath there, and then one right here you can see, and I can see the taproot just below it. Let me see if anything else has shifted this morning. It looks like I'm getting some lift there, nothing to really see yet, but you can see when the soil starts to lift in the general area. And I see some pumice moving here. So it's just starting to happen on these. Then I've also got the NL5, and these front ones are all up. That's good to see at least elbows. And then this one is, looks like another one fully up. That wasn't up an hour ago. Beefcake D, got elbows popping through. Another one right there about to stand all the way up. I'm gonna zip the tent back up. I'm gonna drop the light back down. We've got it angled, plug the humidifier back in. And then uh, next thing that we're gonna do is start to complete the grow room. We've gotta make some soil over here. I've got some stuff to clean up from last round. We're setting up a new 10 by 10 vegetable series. If you haven't checked it out, subscribe check out the vegetable series. Lots to follow along this season. We really appreciate all the interaction. It's been really rewarding to watch the followers rise up on here and see you guys asking questions. And now our staff are hearing you call in and say, I saw you on the YouTube. Some of you are driving into the store. Really appreciate it. That kind of feedback means so much to us. Thank you for letting us do this. If you've got questions, put them down below. If you've got comments, just drop them in, hit the like button. We're trying to get more likes this season. Okay, so I showed you the cover crop being planted. And we jumped back there so you could see me actually sowing the cover crop seed. And now it's been three days since then, only three days. And we're already starting to see it happen. But look, it's, let's look at the 30 gallon. We'll show you one of these and I'll show you the three by three. You can see the cover crop already coming through on the 30 gallon. If I move some straw, you see more coming up here. And so this thin little layer of straw, it'll just lift it all and you won't really have to deal with it. So I can just kind of leave it there. But it also is what helps in nature normally keep that seed sheltered until it fully germinates so I don't have to tend to it so well. Make sure it stays moist in here. I've had people buy 50 pound bags of cover crop, throw it out there on an acre and not water it and call and say, hey, this isn't germinating. Cover crop on a farm, when it comes to fixing nitrogen, a lot of times they drill that seed and they're very judicious with how they use it so they can use smaller amounts and get the maximum dollar return. So although it's just cover crop, it's very important. We want it all to germinate and we want it to stimulate the soil. Let's look at the three by three. Three by three is doing basically the same thing. You can see cover crop coming around pretty much everywhere in here. And that's good to see, that's what we want. When we get to the point where we add the amendments in here based on the soil test, that cover crop will be a few inches tall. We'll be able to work that young green manure, so to speak, into the soil with the amendments, really raising the biological activity and kickstarting the soil to life. Although it's just something really simple, we just wanted to show you every phase here so you can see every detail along the way. I also want you to remember that this is not how you have to do it. There's a thousand ways to do it. The build a soil way is more of a philosophy. And so you don't even have to use the cover crop. It's a big part of what I feel the build a soil way is, but there's times where people may not want to manage the cover crop and they may want to use just compost or dry amendments instead. And so pick and choose which parts of this you like. Don't let one of them stop you from getting started. If you've got everything else except for some cover crop, don't beat yourself up, try it next time. But the next thing we're gonna do is make Clackamas Coots soil from scratch by hand, just like you would if you were following his recipe. And we'll show you how to do it. Then we're gonna put it inside that four by four bed. We're gonna build it from scratch so that you can see the entire process, the PVC, the soil, all the things that it goes to make a four by four. And then we'll address a couple of things that I think is interesting. We're gonna compare the volume of a three by three versus the volume of a four by four. And I think you might be surprised at how big of a difference in soil volume it really is for an arguably similar footprint. So we'll discuss that reasons that you may want to or not want to go bigger in soil container size. We're also gonna mix up the soil and talk about every ingredient while we do so. So look for that episode. I think this four by four of the Coots recipe is gonna be our best soil mixing episode yet. So look for that and I'll catch you guys on the next episode.